Today we want to begin with um, a brief message and um, we'll build up on the topic of prayer and we'll also build up on the uh, children's story uh, that was given today. And to build up on that story, I want us to touch on our need for prayer even as we seek to uh, grow closer with Christ. If we turn to the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis uh, chapter 5, Genesis 5, Genesis chapter 5, um, we'll read something very interesting here. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, which says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Interesting, that Enoch walked with God. Now, I remember the first time I read this scripture, uh, I, I wondered, you know, was Enoch actually walking hand in hand with God? And what does it truly mean to walk with God? Because the result of walking with God is that what? We are taken by God, right? And we see through the experience of Enoch, he was literally taken from this earth <laughs> not to uh, uh, suffer uh, the effects of sin. He is now with God himself. So how is it that we can walk with God? Because we cannot see God but in the same word of God, we're reminded that we are to follow the lamp with us wherever you go. So how do we follow the lamp, yet we cannot see him uh, literally? Now, we need to look at the experience of some of the literal followers of Christ. Uh, we've begun with Enoch, but we want to look at another example of the followers of Christ who have set the, the, the foundation for us to actually follow Jesus, that he may take us. I believe we want to abide with Christ. We want Christ, we want to be in the hands of God himself. That's where our safety is. So let's turn to the book of uh, John. Let's go to the book of John chapter 1. Uh, John chapter 1. And we look at the experience of uh, Christ's first followers who literally walked with God. And this will be a, a lesson for us on how we are to walk with God and even why we are to walk with God as we build up on uh, today's message. So John chapter 1, verses 38. Let's read from verse 37. And it says, And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And uh, the context is they had uh, John the Baptist who... They were his previous disciples, but when they had the voice, when they had uh, John the Baptist pointing to Christ as the Lamb of God, they now followed Jesus, okay? So that's the context. And it says, and the two disciples heard him speak, that's John, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and, sa and saw them following and saith unto them, what seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master. Where dwellest thou? Verse 39. He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. So interesting. We see two of disciples, and through inspiration, we know that the second uh, disciple here was John, who was the beloved of Christ, right? The, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So we have John and Andrew, they hear or they see Jesus and their desire is to follow Jesus or to abide with Jesus, right? And when we think about prayer, many times when we uh, understand the character of Christ or when we come to Christ uh, in prayer, sometimes we rush our prayers. We, 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 as we pray, maybe our minds are drawn to other things, you know, so we quickly rush, you know, dear Heavenly Father, you know, we rush and then amen. And we want to rush and quickly go and attend to what's pending. Yet we see the experience of these two disciples of, of previously John the Baptist and now Christ. They want to abide with Christ. They are walking with Christ. And what's the result? Christ calls them to abide with him and they dwelt where Christ was. And this is the experience we need to build up as we abide with Christ or as we walk with Christ. So as we begin our study, I want us to uh, move into um, which, uh, a good context which has been laid for us 
uh, in our children's story uh, regarding the role or our role as God's people, as a light in this world. We see the experience of Naaman's servant, um, whom was able to point Naaman and his wife to a prophet who was able to heal or guide Naaman to receive healing uh, from uh, leprosy. Now, I want us to turn to the book of, um, let's turn to the book of 1 John. Let's turn to the book of 1 John, chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2, and let's read verse 27. So in order for us to dwell with Christ, there's also something we need. We need uh, something known as an anointing, okay? And we'll build up, as we build up our study, 1 John chapter 2, and let's read verse 27. And it says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So in order for us to abide in Christ, we need an anointing. The same anointing which Christ received, which is of the Holy Spirit. And we're reminded in the book of John that the same Spirit of God will teach us all things, will lead us into all truth, will convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Not only us, but the need for us to teach all these things to others, to present the truth pure and defiled to others. And this also comes in with our connection with God through prayer. And this, I believe, was able to prepare even Naaman's servant, the, the, the girl servant, in order to even direct them or direct Naaman or Naaman's wife to the healing or uh, God's prophet who's able to provide healing. She must have had a relationship with Christ. So notice, this servant was dwelling in a foreign land in a foreign family, yet she was able to maintain a devotional life. So this did not start just uh, um, uh, it was not haphazard, her prayer life. It had to begin from an early age, right? And we're going to look at the history of the Israelites on how they prepared their children to be a light, right, in this dark world. And with that said, let's turn to the book of um, Second Chronicles. Let's go to the book of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Um, Second Chronicles, chapter 36. Second Chronicles, chapter 36. And we'll read from verses 5 to 7. Second Chronicles, um, chapter 36, verses 5 to 7. And let's read. Now, the, we're building up from the story uh, given during the, from the children's story given um, regarding the servant who was in a, f in a family. She was away from her family, but she was able to minister and point the, 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 her masters to Jesus or to the prophet who led them eventually to Jesus Christ. Okay? So Second Chronicles chapter 36, we're going to see some lessons. Let's read from verses 5 to 7. Second Chronicles 36, from verses 5 to 7. And it says, Jehoiakim was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. So notice, Jehoiakim, um, who was raised to fear God, he chose to do evil in the sight of God. And then verse 6, against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Then verse 7, Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. So Jehoiakim, as a king, when he took over as ruler of God's people, we see that he chose to do evil in the sight of the Lord. And this is in contrast to um, a Naaman servant, uh, a, a lady servant, whom was taken captive 
to a foreign a family who, uh, who did not know God, yet she chose to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. She probably did her morning devotions, her prayers, and for that reason, the, her masters were able to trust her counsel regarding uh, this uh, uh, man of God who would be able to provide healing. All right? So we are contrasting um, God's people when they're in captivity. And here we see uh, uh, God's king or um, a man of God who uh, uh, is, is free, yet they are choosing to do what is evil. So sometimes uh, uh, we may realize that God may allow us to go in uh, hard places in order to, to uh, 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 make us unstable in a way, to make us uh, fear him more. Right? So sometimes when we are too comfortable in life, when things are going very well, we tend to stray away from God. But God may take that away in order for us or for, in order for him to grow our love for him. Now let's read on. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, let's go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. And we're still building up. Deuteronomy 32. And we'll read verses 8. Deuteronomy 32, and we'll read verse 8, right? So we see sometimes God separates us from those whom we're comfortable with, uh, uh, from our own people, and brings us to a foreign place, all for the glory of his name. And remember, this separation comes when we have been prepared, right? God uh, gives us opportunity to be prepared to be in a foreign place or in a situation where we can be able to minister, okay? So Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8 says, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel, right? So we see the Lord had a work in separating the sons of Adam. He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. And we see the same when he was dividing the, 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 the tribes of Israel. He divided them for a purpose, right? So that he could work out his perfect plan in uh, allowing God's people to be scattered, okay? And now we want to shift uh, to a point where God not only scatters us amongst ourselves, but he scattered the Israelites among a heathen nations, all right? So sometimes the Lord may allow us to go to different locations, uh, different situations, our place of work, our places of school. He may even send us out of this country to, to a place where we may feel uncomfortable, but it's all for his glory, all right, for his purpose. And uh, I believe going with the theme uh, of, of the, 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 the quarterly, uh, God is calling us to be evangelists, right? And evangelism may not allow us to go to the most comfortable place or the most pleasing uh, situation, all right? So that's, that's the theme we're trying to go with. So let's turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 13. Uh, we're building up the need for prayer. And the need, uh, as we pray, the Lord prepares us for a special work. Acts chapter 13 Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13, and let's read, um, let's read from verses 46, the experience of Paul and Barnabas, Acts chapter 13, verses 46, and we will read to 48, and it says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Right. So what's the context here? Paul and Barnabas go to share God's work to the Jews. Right. So sometimes we may dwell, I believe, too much on evangelism within to the point that we become too, you know, there's, there's a word uh, in Swahili, ume kuzoyana. No, we can swear even God's word, right? If we uh, don't uh, see the precious truths or uh, see how Christ gave himself that we may have the freedom to actually receive these truths, we may handle the word uh, or trifle the word. Maybe that's the right English word. We may trifle with God's word to the point that we don't, you know, it's like, yes, it's, you know, we have it. But look at the result. 
from verse 47. As they turn to the Gentiles, what happens? Verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Right? So, the Jews refusing God's word led Paul and Barnabas to uh, speak with the Gentiles and they received the word. They received it with joy and they believed. And we see later on many were even baptized, right? So sometimes when we are trifle with the word of God, remember God still has his people who cherish his word, who cherish the, the, the truth, who cherish that he gave his life for us. And why is this so? Why is it that we, we are given the word of God, yet we handle it lightly, right? So let's, let's turn to the Bible again. Let's go to the book of Hosea. Let's turn to the book of Hosea. Hosea. Uh, Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. Um, and we'll read, um, we'll read verses 6, Hosea chapter 4, verses 6 to 10. Hosea chapter 4, verses 6 to 10, and it says, Hosea chapter 4, verses 6 to 10, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. Verse 9, And there shall be like Sorry, and there shall be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them uh, their doings. Verse 10, for they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off um, to take heed to the Lord. So it's interesting, the Lord is saying that God's people have not only, uh, uh, are not only destroyed because of a lack of knowledge, but because we have what? Rejected knowledge. And you cannot reject something you have not uh, received, isn't it? So for God's people to reject, it means there's either an opportunity to receive and they refused, or they received and they refused. But it, it, the word of God continues to say that as they were increased, what happened? They set their heart on iniquity, right? So the more they received, the more God uh, prospered them, the more we seeing them what depart from God. Going back to the children's story again, and the, 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 the story that we learn today, that perhaps God is calling us away from those things, those people, those jobs, right? Those uh, environments which are causing us to sin and bring us to a place where we are to repent, right? And repent isn't simply just saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Repent is a turning away from sin. Right? So the Lord puts us in certain situations where we will turn away from sin and not only end there, but will also cause others or those whom we are brought into a, a close a relationship with to also learn and fear the Lord. Let's read on. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. And we'll read verses 13. What is the result? When we reject knowledge, in context of uh, what we read um, in, in, in uh, regards, regarding Jehoiakim, okay? So we're building up the study. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 13. It says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity. Why? Because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. So God's people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. No knowledge of what? 
of Christ. What does it mean to know God? It's to turn away from sin. When you know the character of Christ, or when, when you know someone, it means you, you understand their character. You know the things that pleases them, the things that are, uh, displease them. You know how to, uh, um, uh, f- uh, to relate with them. Right? So knowing God should actually result in a change uh, in our behavior around God. And knowing that he knows all things, he's omnipotent, omnipresent, it means that our very life, through the knowledge of Jesus, should change. But what happens? Because we don't know God, because we don't understand his character, God's people have been taken into captivity. Let's read on. Let's go to the book of um, Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. Let's go to the book of Isaiah 38. As we build up how God's people went into captivity. So we're going to read about a king, King Hezekiah. Isaiah 38. Let's read from verse 1. And it says... A very, a very familiar story, Isaiah 38, verse 1, from verse 1. It says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord, and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept so. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. Isn't that a genuine prayer? Uh, Naturally, before sin, God made us that we should be actually uh, immortal. That's after eating the fruit. Uh, If if God had permitted it to eat, uh, sorry, the, the fruit of the tree of life. So it is not natural for us to actually want to die, right? Uh, God put it in us to want to live, right? (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me, and by God's grace, uh, if we're faithful, we will have eternal life. But here we see Hezekiah, after he's sick unto death, he turns his face towards the wall, which is a sign of actually repentance. And he asks the Lord uh, to have mercy on him. And he points out certain things that he has done, right? So, I don't know, as I read this under, you know, uh, because of the results afterward, probably it was in God's. Uh, uh, mercy that Hezekiah should actually rest. Because as we read on, let's go to the book of 2 Kings. Uh, 2 Kings, uh, still the same story, 2 Kings chapter 20. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20 from verse 1. And it says, again, The same story, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore, and we know the result. Now, for those who know this story, we know that Hezekiah did not live or was not faithful to his calling after the Lord increased his life, right? Or the years of his life, right? So sometimes the Lord may want to take away something good from us to keep us from some evil that's coming, right? And we see in Hezekiah, in his genuine prayer, the Lord actually hearkens. So the Lord may actually allow us to even have those things which are for our downfall, isn't it, right? For us, in the end of the day, to truly speak that, Lord, truly you are 
just and faithful. Despite you directing me in this certain way, I chose a different way. I saw the consequences and the results. Though negative, yet you are faithful, Lord. He's so merciful to us. Even those things that bring us harm, he still allows us to have them. He's, he's a very, very mysterious. Now let's go to Isaiah 39. We see the result. Isaiah 39. Let's go to Isaiah 39. Isaiah 39. Let's read from verses 1 to 2. Now we see Hezekiah's life has been extended and word goes round throughout the world that look, you know, there's this king, his life was extended after, uh, after he was, you know, he was sick and he was ailing as um, uh, uh, Catherine had shared earlier. Now regarding Naaman, Isaiah 39 from verse 1, it says, At that time, Mero Merodach Bal Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered, verse 2, and Hezekiah was glad of them and shewed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah shewed them not. So interesting, he's received healing. And now when those who don't know God, those who are considered the Gentiles, as you see the experience of um, Paul and Barnabas, after they were sent away from God's people, they went to the Gentiles, they shared what? The gospel of Jesus. Now Hezekiah has a similar opportunity the Gentiles come to him, yet he shows them material things. Things that are corrupted over time by rust or moth. Things that have no eternal value. What are those things that are, we hold on to that have no eternal value? You know, is it your work? Is it your education? Is it, um, you know, what is it? your material wealth, what is it that you show to people? Do you show the gospel to people? Or do people know you as that person who speaks about himself or herself or those things revolving around themselves? Or do people see Jesus when they are with you? So let's read on. Let's see the result. Let's go to the book of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles, oops, sorry. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. And we read verse 24. What is it that caused Hezekiah to show um, uh, these leaders of Babylon things, you know, all these, his material wealth? What is it? Second Chronicles. 32 from verse 24. Let's read. It says, In those days, Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. Verse 25, But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. So the Lord in his mercy extends his life, but Hezekiah does not render the same mercy or kindness. Uh, which uh, Christ showed him by extending his life, by proclaiming uh, his goodness. So what does he do? Or what happened? It says, For his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 26, Notwithstanding Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Now it's interesting that despite uh, Hezekiah's heart being lifted up, the Lord again humbled him. And then we, we again we're just seeing the story of God's mercy towards us. He directs us in a certain way, 
we ask for something else. He gives it to us. We, we sin. Again, he, he shows us the wrong, the wrong of our doings. And then, again, he humbles us and what? Forgives us, right? So throughout the Bible, those who followed the Lamb, those who are following uh, the disciples as they followed Christ, they were following his character, his mercy. But his mercy also came with justice, right? The Lord would render to us what we deserve, isn't it? Or what we ask for, right? But if the Lord treated us as we deserve, then I believe all of us wouldn't be, be present here. So as we close, I want us to look at the result of Hezekiah's unfaithfulness. It did not only end with him, it actually extended towards his children. And now I want us to go to the book of um, Isaiah, Isaiah uh, 48, I believe. Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48. Sorry, is it Isaiah? Sorry, uh, 2 Kings. 2 Kings 21. Uh, let's go to 2 Kings 21 for the interest, because of the interest of time. 2 Kings 21. As we close, as we prepare to close. 2 Kings 21. And let's read verses 1 to 3. 2 Kings 21, verses 1 to 3. Now, Hezekiah, three years after the Lord extended his life, him and his wife, Hezipah, if I'm not wrong, had a son. And if you're familiar with the name of his son, his son was called Manasseh, right? And Manasseh was an evil king, right? Manasseh is the one who actually led uh, God's people into captivity, right? So let's read 2 Kings 21 verses 1 to 3. And it says, Manasseh was 12 years old. So notice the age. I will compare it with um, someone else. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah's father had destroyed. And he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab king of Israel and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. So notice King Hezekiah, as much as he did repent, the way he brought up his son prepared him to be a very evil king. Why? Manasseh took leadership at 12 years old, right? So sometimes we have our children, um, uh, we don't realize that even at 12, they are still able to, to know what their purpose is, right? If we, if we direct them in the right way. Why do I say this? Manasseh, because of how his uh, parents raised him up, at 12 years old, he became a very evil king. Now contrast this with someone else. Let's go to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 and let's read verses 42, 49 and 52. Luke chapter 2. Let's read verses 49. Luke chapter 2. Sorry, let's read from verse 42. It says... And when he was 12 years old, who's this who was 12 years old? Jesus Christ. Manasseh, when he was 12 years old, he was an evil king. Let's compare him with Jesus Christ, who was raised up by very simple, in a very simple home, with very, uh, what you'd consider parents who had very simple occupations. At 12 years old, what is it that came to the mind of Christ? And when he was 12 years old, Jesus, they went up to Jerusalem after the, after the custom of the feast. Verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Then verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Hezekiah, because of his past life, he raised up a child who was considered one of the most evil in the history of uh, uh, Israel. At 12 years old, 
Manasseh had the wisdom to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord. What we would consider a child, not even a teenager. Jesus Christ, at the age of 12 years old, he was able to know what his purpose is, which is to, to serve God. And that's why he had to give the answer here in verse 49. We still know that I must be about my father's business. And it's because of how he was raised by his parents. So it's not about the social class. It's not about the advantages you're given. But it's about being intentional in serving God now. And part of the quarterly talks about evangelism. Evangelism isn't just about opening the word of God and, you know, telling people to accept Jesus. Evangelism is how you live. Because we see in these two stories how the parents lived affected the children and their destiny and their purpose, right? As we close, on us to read uh, two more verses. Uh, let's go to the book of Proverbs, uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs 29, and I believe I'll, I'll close with that. Proverbs 29, and we'll read from verses 15 to 17. And we'll connect this with the prayer, with prayer. Proverbs 29, 15 to 17. It says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Normally when we read this verse, of course, we can apply it practically to our families, and it should be. But as I read this verse, I remember uh, the prayer which uh, Christ taught his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven. As we address our Father, it means that we are his children. We are his sons and daughters. And sometimes he may reprove us. Uh, he may chasten us. He may correct us. That he may bring us in the right way. We see the two, the two comparisons between Jesus and Manasseh. How their parents raised them up. How they brought them up in the fear of the Lord. Prepared them for their calling at a very early age. And it's the same thing with us. At a very early age, which is when obviously we are baptized. When we accept uh, Jesus uh, as our Lord and Savior. As we uh, 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 believe that uh, in faith we die with him and are resurrected in the newness of life where we are now considered uh, his children spiritually, um, the Lord is calling us to a newness of life. He's calling us to align uh, our will with his will. And there will be challenges. He'll correct us. He'll sometimes you know, move us, tap us on the left, on the right, but it's to keep us on the narrow way, right? Because he knows the impact. And let us be conscious of our lives or how we live our lives because we do impact those who are watching. Not only our families, but our places of work, uh, our, place, our school, those we conduct business with. They are watching. And God is also watching. The whole universe or the host of heaven is watching. But God has promised that he will give us power to be able to stand. He will give us the ability as a people, to be a witness in this dark world. And let's, let me just please close with one more verse. I know I'm supposed to close, close with one more verse, but let's close with Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, uh, verses uh, 6 and 7. Isaiah 42, verses 6 and 7. And it says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, I will hold thine hand, just like a child, isn't it? When a child is growing up, you see the parents holding the hand so that they don't fall or stumble. So the Lord promises to do, that, do the same for us because we are his children. And will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Then verse 7, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. 
Then verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Excuse me. So as much as the Lord has called us righteousness, he's also called us for a special work. There are those who are blind among us, those who are in darkness, whom he's calling us to lead them out. But someone who's in prison or someone who's in darkness cannot lead others out of darkness, isn't it? We also need a light. You need a lamp, right? In order to see you're in darkness, you need a lamp, right? And we need the same lamp to guide others out of darkness. The lamp is the word of God. Not just this word of God, but the word of God living in us. The same word that became flesh. It's Jesus Christ. So my prayer is that as we begin this uh, new week, as we uh, come to a close uh, of, the, of the message, um, may we consider how we are allowing the Lord to lead us. And that truly he is our father. We are his children, right? And because we are his children, he tells us and he bids us, he calls us, ask of anything of me and you will receive it. Ask in according to his will. And you can only know his will as you commune with him, like the first two disciples. Know where Christ abides. Dwell with him. Don't rush your devotions with him. Don't rush your prayer. Just be with him. He's the creator of all things. He's the one who knows the problems you know, you're going through. You know, sometimes we rush thinking that we are going back to solve the issues, yet there is no power that we have to solve those issues. Imagine God, the creator of all things. He knows all things. He can help us to solve these issues that we may have, these concerns, these cares, the anxieties. He will bring true peace, perfect peace, uh, which is found in his uh, righteousness. Let's, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, rightly so because we are your sons and daughters and how much more are you willing to give us those things which are sufficient and beneficial to our needs and even from the experience of Hezekiah, even our wants, Lord, even when they bring harm to us, Lord, you still give us these things. Uh, truly, you are a mysterious God. And we still see your hand of mercy uh, guide us in this dark world. And Lord, we thank you that even amidst the darkness, uh, we're able to see your goodness. We're able to receive the joy of your salvation. Not that we may enjoy it for ourselves, not that we may be prideful, but that we may guide others and in humility, a plead for their souls. Plead for our souls as you intercede for us, Lord, as you plead on our behalf. Please help us, Lord, to truly love you. Help us to hate sin. And help us to experience true repentance, a true turning away from sin. As we too see the two experiences of your children, of Manasseh, who eventually repented, at a young age, you called him to lead, but he chose otherwise. It was necessary that you send your son, Jesus Christ, whom at an early age knew his purpose was to redeem mankind. So help us, Lord, to meditate on, on your son, Jesus. Help us to see through his lens that we may strive for not only our salvation, but the salvation of others, not only our friends, but even our enemies, those who hate us, Lord. For he was reviled and he reviled not, Lord. Please give us the character of your son. And I pray that you may help us uh, to truly enjoy the Sabbath day and fellowship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Glory be to God for